Freeland has always valued the role of the media as very, being very important and powerful. We, we respect journalists. So uh, right now we're going through, all of us, a global crisis affected by this coronavirus. So each of us can play an important role in helping to solve it, uh, including the media, including NGOs like ourselves, and then government agencies and intergovernmental organizations, some of whom are, are here today. So what we're going to do today is share some information and insights that we have on wildlife trafficking that can help solve this crisis and prevent it from getting worse and from reoccurring. I don't think there's any question anymore that wildlife trafficking is a serious threat. Uh, we've always known it's a serious threat to wild animals and biodiversity. We're going through the fastest rate of species loss ever in history right now. Uh, and also the money that's being made, which is in the billions and billions, is arming organized crime and, and strengthening corruption. And now we also see, as many conservationists have pointed out, not just us for many years, that uh, wild animals, the wildlife trade can lead to outbreaks uh, as well. Now, what happened yesterday the announcement that came out of China, this changes everything. And we think it changes it for the better. China really, first of all, needs to be commended for taking this action, which is not an easy one. Certainly, obviously, very necessary. But uh, they've just shut down a $7.5 billion a year industry in China alone, and it, which could be 10 times that amount when you bring in the workforce and the distributors and everybody else involved in that trade. But we're here to tell you that this problem is, um, there's much more to do basically because this problem, it goes way beyond China. It goes beyond pangolins and it goes beyond coronavirus. These kind of viruses, as some of you have read and know, have happened before. They're going to happen again. And what we will show you in the report and today is that the same criminal supply chains, the same criminal syndicates that supplied those wild animals to Wuhan and other parts of China have also supplied those same animals to other markets right across this region in the same conditions. There are sleeping time bombs across Southeast Asia, including right here in Thailand. Indonesia, for example, has some of the biggest bat markets in the world. You probably read that with SARS and here with coronavirus, the probable original vector was bats. These, these markets are still open. Laos and Vietnam are selling pangolins, and you can find pretty much everything else that was on the menu in Wuhan and the other wet markets in Laos and Vietnam today. Next door in Myanmar, up in Mongla and other parts of uh, the country, all kinds of wild animals still for sale, mixed wet markets. This is the problem, is lots of wild animals from different parts of the world coming into uh, what some people have called a perfect storm. It's a cocktail that's going to make people sick. You see a civet on the left there. The civets are what, uh, the civets were the, uh, the cause perhaps the, the intermediary animal uh, after bats with SARS. Thailand, right here in Bangkok and in Pattaya, we have restaurants that today are selling snake, pangolin, turtle, other exotic species. We got Jetachak Market, which you might think of as a place that's selling birds and bunnies and cats. There's all kinds of animals from around the world and just like China, there's a wildlife breeding industry here that's legal. There are registered breeders, but some of them get their stock from illegal imports. And so these animals are mixed in. Also, you can go to Jato Jack, and if, you might not find a pangolin in a cage there, but you can find somebody who's going to sell it to you. And if you don't want to go there, you can just order it online. These are recent 
still grabs. They're in English, they're in Thai. There's people selling plenty of pangolins right here and across the region. And if you don't want to go in the open net, you can go to the dark web and find all kinds of wildlife. So this trade has been out of control. Taking a closer look at the supply chains, Thailand has been a major transit of pangolin trafficking. Over 50% of the pangolins that would have been found in Wuhan and other parts of Chinese markets have been transited this country. Let's uh, take a look now at a, at a typical pangolin factory. Uh, this footage came to us courtesy of the Indonesia National Police, which busted uh, this factory. There are others like it. Basically, uh, what you'll see in a moment is a, it almost looks like a big meth lab where they will take the animals that have been brought to them in mesh nets and they will strip them of their scales and then put the uh, bodies, they will wash them and then freeze them. Because there's two byproducts with pangolins. There's, the, there's the, the meat, the body itself, which sells as an exotic uh, uh, meal. And then there's also the scales, which are ground down into powder and sold for medicine. Pangolin scales are uh, an active ingredient for many kinds of medicines. I'm going to get some IT support there. Uh, it's an active ingredient for many kinds of traditional Chinese medicines and also is believed to uh, induce lactation for women who have, may have um, born a baby. I'll back up just a second while they're trying to fix that. Basically, the, the supply chains, there's multiple lanes for the traffickers to get, looks like this might be working, uh, to get the product. Here you see the International Police. So this is a video that they made. Here they are going into the factory. Uh, this is industrial scale packaging. This is the way the supply chain works. So these penguins would have come from Indonesia, some from Malaysia, some from Cambodia, Thailand doesn't have too many pangolins left. You can find some on the islands. And then increasingly, they're coming from other parts of the world. These are basically scaly anteaters. Here they've just dug up some that have been packaged. They will have been put in cargo, concealed as something else, usually sent in the tons. They've got refrigeration rooms, washing rooms. And they will be uh, preparing these at sort of three, four. We even saw one shipment going into Vietnam one time of 24 metric tons. So one, uh, one ton is going to be, there we see the body parts, they're separating. One ton on average is going to be about 2,000 pangolins of scales, that is. So the supplies in Asia have been going down. So the the supply chains have been moving over to Africa. So you'll see different lanes selected by these organized crime groups, bringing them by boat from different parts of the world or by car, by truck and car through Thailand. Sometimes they'll take a chance and go into Haiphong Harbor or directly into Hai Ka ha Hong Kong or southwest of there. Uh, we've also seen shipments come into Lam Chabang. It's basically very much like the uh, drug trafficking. They'll select different lanes depending on which ones are clear that day and don't cost them so much. And since it has been more difficult to move live bodies, we've also seen them separate shipments now just into bodies and scales. This is a typical one. This is a three-ton shipment that was on its way to Laos via Thailand from the Congo. This is on Turkish Airlines. Through, we estimate 5 to 10 percent of these are actually being intercepted. This is, a, I think, the largest one just last year in Singapore, a nine-ton shipment, equivalent of about 18,000 dead animals. There's no carcasses in there. I mean, there's no, it, it, this is all scales. Vietnam has been a major consumer 
and middlemen, not too many pangolins left at all in Vietnam, but a big part of the supply chain is coming from Vietnam, as we'll show you some of the characters involved in just a minute. And we see mixed cargo. Some of the same traffickers that are moving pangolins, they are the same traffickers that are moving tigers and other big cats, turtles, snakes, rhino horn, ivory. It's the same supply chains. Now, besides the threat of coronavirus, we are obviously very concerned about the threat toward these wild animals, biodiversity in general and to society in other ways, but also we should know that these animals can pose other health risks to people. A lot of people probably don't realize that coming into contact or consuming uh, a tiger can get you sick in different ways. You can get a certain kind of tuberculosis from tigers. And due to the big demand, mainly in China and Vietnam, but partly here, uh, for tiger bones, there's also been an increased trade in lion bones. And the reason being is partly when you take a lion skeleton and put them next to a tiger one, if you remove the head, the bodies look pretty much the same. So there's a little bit of fraud going on, but there is also a demand for lion bones for the medicine trade. Now, it gets interesting because over in South Africa, which is the biggest source, there is a legal trade, but there's also a quota that is being um, exceeded at times. One of the big sources is Canned Hunts. That's a member of uh, one of the syndicates over there sourcing lions. Basically, they will pay for the skeletons after the canned or safari hunts are done. This is a, a shot taken of a lion bone processing uh, area where they boil the bones and prepare them in body bags. We've been out to the airport here at Sawanabum before and it stinks like a rotting skeleton. Uh, and those are in transit on the way to Laos or to Vietnam. This is a big trade. And uh, it gets even more interesting in that the same traffickers have now decided to grow tigers over in South Africa. And that's a shot on the left of a tiger being dismembered inside South Africa. These tigers are roaming in the same areas where the lions are now, and we have reason to believe they're bagging up the bones as lions because there's a legal trade and sending it over here. Rhino horn trafficking, still huge, but relevant to coronavirus in a dangerous way right now. There are traders in China that right now are offering rhino horn as a panacea for coronavirus. We don't know what to do about that, but it's a fact that we have to work with. And of course, rhino horn trade coming through Thailand, Thai police and Thai customs have done an excellent job detecting and trying to stop this. I doubt too many people know what that is. That's a new product on the scene. We have no idea if this is going to bring any kind of disease or not, but those are rhino skins. And these are also being smuggled from Africa over to Asia by the same supply chains. And let's not forget about elephants. They might not be spreading a disease to you right now, but they are being killed every 30 minutes for the trade in elephant tusks over in Burma, also for their skins, which is being sold as a, a skin pigment thing. And thankfully here in Thailand, we've seen enforcement go way up. You will have noticed lots of posters and awareness about this. So ivory traders are now switching to other lanes other than Thailand to move this product through. We've got snakes and turtle trade. Lots of young ones. It's illegal in some countries, including the United States, to sell little turtles and tortoises at a young age because they can pass salmonella to people. This is how they're detected out at the airport. Big trade coming from South Asia through here. We also still have a live exotic pet trade. Any one of these animals that are sometimes smuggled even on first class airlines to the Middle East could take a disease with them. These would be traced back to the online markets I showed you before. 
also to dealers at Chattochak Market. And strange as it may seem, these same traffickers that are moving the penguins, the turtles, the snakes, the other species I showed you, uh, they're involved in the dog trade. This is a picture of over 800 live dogs stuffed in the back of trucks on the way to Vietnam through the border point of Lak Sao in, in Laos. So who's behind this trade? We know some. Some we won't talk about today because there's ongoing investigations, but this is a crisis and we all need to know what's happening. This is Vichai Gelsuang. He is a former military intelligence officer from the Lao Army. He was Mr. Big up in Lao. After years and years of trying to get him, authorities endorsed us outing him in the media, which has slowed his business down, but apparently it has not stopped him entirely. But this is family organized crime. So you get one person, the network is robust enough for it to go. Let me show you some of the other people and we'll come back to how they're operating. This is Mao Qian. He's a gangster from Vietnam. He was a major trafficker, thanks to the work of the NGO ENV and the good work of environmental police in Vietnam. They finally got him sourcing the same wildlife. He is in, his syndicate was in competition from the other one I'm going to show you. He was caught, obviously, as you can see. He's going to serve a modest time. Uh, and pay a, a relatively modest fine, but at least it was progress. They caught him. Now we've got the Chayamat family, based out of Chayapum, Thailand. Anybody watches Narcos? This is the equivalent of the, the Pacific Queen, Queen Pin. Uh, she was caught and had $37.5 million worth of assets seized by the Thai anti-money laundering organization. I'll let them speak about this later. And we got the Bach family. This is Vietnamese organized crime, based in Laos, also in Thailand. But he was pushed out of Thailand. That's his brother, Bun Chai Bach, based up in Nakhon Phnom before. And this is all of them celebrating their profits together, Vichai Gyo Suang, the Bachs. They all work together in an alliance that we call Hydra. It's a Hydra-headed um, syndicate. And after Vichai was supposedly put out of business, here he's caught with his hands on the goods. These are pangolin scales. 50 kilograms per bag, which is about 50 dead animals. There's Bunchai's network on the left, moving some mystery meat packaged up in plastic bags going over the border into Laos, and there you see Vichai on the right with it packaged there. We don't know what that is. There's a lot of mystery in this wildlife trade still. These people are moving things. It's an unregulated trade. You don't exactly have the Food and Drug Administration uh, checking their cargo, which has been a problem. Then, of course, they've got suppliers and people to work with from Africa, including the man on the left who has been caught now, Mwazu Kroma, a Liberian national who has spent lots of time over in this neck of the woods. And he has colleagues who are still operating right down the street in Bangkok and other parts of Thailand who were responsible for bringing in pangolin carcasses, scales, rhino horns, ivory, and more. He, through the good work of the United States government, working with African governments, was actually moved from uh, Uganda over to New York. He's sitting in a jail cell. But as I said, part of the network is still active right now. And they are still in a position to circumvent law enforcement as long as it's weak. There's a big... Uh, criminal contingent based here in Bangkok and a few other parts of, of Thailand that are helping to move these wildlife commodities through the country. So uh, just to finish up here in a second, what we've seen over the years and what we're concerned about right now is that wildlife traffickers have been able to circumvent the law. 
they're definitely winning in this game. So with China doing what it did this week, banning the trade, it's a very good move. First of all, uh, as we look at what's happened more closely, it may not be a permanent ban. It gives time for them to create a new or update their wildlife law. And you can be sure, based on how much money there is, that some people are going to wait it out, hope that this virus kind of fades away from the news, just like it did with SARS, and they will have their animals back on that list. So there's a bit of drama going on right now in China. The president has done the right thing. We hope that he can stick it out. People are going to uh, count on their attention span going somewhere else at some point. But what we, the reason that the traffickers are winning is, as you see, the trade is run by organized crime. They pay a lot better than us NGOs or international organizations, and they pay on time. Law enforcement, including the environmental police and others, have been very under-resourced to fight this. And the courts just really haven't taken it seriously. And it must be said that not just in any particular country, all of them, this trade cannot be happening without some corruption. We need to find out who's involved. So, how to stop this trafficking? And this is in our report as well. Cross-border enforcement cooperation has been tried and tested, and it works. It's inexpensive. We've had folks come together from China, Africa, Thailand, other countries before, exchange intelligence, and they've been able to weaken some of these supply chains. There was a network before called the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network. Uh, it, something like this needs to be reactivated because right now China can't stop this trade by itself. Almost all the wild animals on those markets in China came from other countries. China has some animals left, but they're not the ones that are on the menu. They're coming from here, Indonesia, other parts of Africa. They need cooperation with the source in transit countries. And we've seen when focal points from different countries, like here, Vietnam, Congo, Brazzaville, Kenya, Tanzania, work together, they found who some of the suppliers were. This kind of work we were doing was just to put a finger in the dike and buy time for behavior change, for demand reduction. We never imagined that a pangolin could all of a sudden be featured in the coronavirus and actually get people to stop consuming and to think twice. So there's a huge opportunity here for enforcement to get support to do more than put their finger in the dike and to break these supply chains once and for all while these laws take root. There's been good results when such cooperations happen between Malawi, Thailand, and some other countries. They had this man on the run who is in cahoots with folks right here in this city, Mari Conte, who is smuggling different kinds of wildlife, particularly ivory, from Africa over into Southeast Asia. Bun Chai Bak, the younger brother of Bak Van Lim, who we showed before, because of cooperation between different agencies and a few countries, was caught, arrested, and a major gang over in the Congo was also discovered. This is all because of enforcement cooperation between the source, transit, and consumer countries. Now, the laws in this region, they're better, definitely. They're new in some cases, and in some cases still a little bit fuzzy, but certainly in most countries still low priority when it comes to wildlife. Bunchai Bak, for example, was prosecuted but was not convicted, and he is free living high off the hog, may not be at the steering wheel right now, but it's a family organized crime group. It continues. Our queen pin also still free and boasting about her wealth. So to change this game, we need to put more emphasis on the role of police and other law enforcement agencies so that the Department of National Parks and CITES are not left alone to fight this with their few resources.
So we're very glad to have the police here with us today. We also need to resurrect a regional network in this region to share intelligence and to close some of these markets that, across the region, which are sleeping time bombs. Prosecutors need to treat this as organized crime and perhaps right now as a health threat as well. And we need to find all this money. People talk about all the money being made on wildlife trafficking. Nobody knows exactly how much. It's probably an underestimate. Let's say it's $20 billion. What we don't ask is where's all that money? Let's find it. Let's dig it up and reprogram it into recovery programs and incentivize good enforcement. So finally, we think that the Thai government and the other governments across the region should follow China's lead, close the markets, recover the assets, and reprogram them toward wildlife recovery programs, which would include the agencies that are taking the lead. Thank you.